God always shows up in sinful situations, in a fallen world, and he begins to transform it. And I think we need to think very much. Maybe this would be another one, what I call spiritual algebra lessons, because you have to think about it. When the Lord is standing in the context of a very sinful culture, and he is going to carve out of that culture his New Testament church, and he is going to want them to model what it means to be truly believers and saints of the Most High God, and yet he is dealing with people who are at their very heart sinful and wicked. And we get frustrated with Jesus because we want Jesus to deal with the outer sin. But listen, sin is always an inside job. It's always something that God has to deal with from the inside out. And so the Lord begins to deal with the problem and the wickedness in his culture. And one of the truly wicked things about the New Testament culture is that it was oppressive to women. They were in some ways property. And, and if Jesus had just stood up and, and, and tried to overthrow the culture, the culture would have rebelled and probably walked away and there would have been no hope. So what he begins to do, in my opinion, as I look at it, is deal with the sin at the heart level. Deal with what's going on at the heart level. And I've spent weeks now studying what it means to be a biblical woman and I'm telling you, after all these decades, I, I've been studying the Word of God and preaching the Word of God since I was 16 years old. And as I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus and, and learning more about what it means to be a biblical woman, at times I step back and go, wow, there's things here I'm learning. Can you believe that? You can teach an old dog new tricks. And one thing I have learned is that God created women, and I, ladies, I'd like a really a hearty amen here. God created women to be honored, <laughs> appreciated, nurtured, and protected. Is that all right to say that? I'm one of those old-fashioned people who believe that one of the fundamental jobs of men on this earth is to protect women. You always get between them and the danger. Amen? So, God created women to be honored, appreciated, nurtured, and protected. But so often when society gets full of sin, women are dishonored. They are unappreciated. They are neglected. And they are unprotected. In fact, they're even attacked. Either physically or verbally, they are attacked. And this is not God's plan. And so I want to challenge you, guys. Challenge you. Survey. Come with me. As I have looked at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I'm looking at these four records of the earthly life of Jesus, I think Jesus shows a little favoritism toward women, and I'm offended by it. He looked at one of his disciples one time and said, Satan? He never said anything like that to a woman. He, at times, raised his voice to men, but he never raises his voice to a woman. Hello? What's the deal? He always approaches them in gentleness. No matter what situation they are, he, he approaches them in gentleness as daughters of the Most High God. You guys having fun yet? Have you ever noticed how daughters wrap daddies around their fingers? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Do we have a witness down here? <clears throat> I listened to a story the other day. This family is heading down the road, 
at highway speed. All of a sudden, Dad puts on the brakes, pulls over real quickly to the shoulder of the road, comes to a screeching stop. The wife says, what? What? He hops out, pulls his jacket off, opens the back door, wraps up his little girl, gets back in, closes the door and takes off. And she says, what in the world are you doing? He said, didn't you hear? That baby is cold. You didn't hear her in the back seat saying, Daddy, I'm cold. That is the kind of attitude that the Heavenly Father has toward His daughters. Amen? Every time, if I am smart, if I am biblical, if I am spiritual, every time I deal with my wife or any other female in my life, I should be dealing with them understanding that I am dealing with the daughter of the Most High God. Wow, I thought I'd get some amens there. Ladies, you're really dropping the ball there. I'm dealing with the daughters of the Most High God. So crouched in this sexist society, the Gospels begin to undermine that sin and sexism from the inside out. It begins to work on it from the inside out. And that's what we're going to learn. I have... I've got some messages to preach about what does a, a woman of God look like. But before I do, I want to deal with the way that Jesus destroyed the oppression of women through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I call this part of this series, Lessons from the Ladies. <laughs> Isn't that cheesy? <laughs> Lessons from the Ladies. <clears throat> because it is through these Lessons from the Ladies that Jesus is chipping away at the heart of sexism against women. He is elevating them and destroying the oppression against them. The first lesson from the lady, we'll talk about from Mary, God uses the humble. God uses the humble. Luke chapter 1, verse 46, though I could go to several other places. I chose this one because I think it's the clearest. It says, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Watch this. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. In other words, Mary said, I am nothing impressive at all. Nothing about me would get your attention. Nothing about me would tell you that I'm some great person with some great pedigree. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. The first lesson from the lady comes from Jesus' mother, Mary. And that is that God uses the humble. God uses the humble. God uses the humble. <laughs> you got that yet? I feel like I'm, I'm spinning my wheels here. If you're in a humble estate, you're in a position where God can use you to do something great. Forever we will celebrate this young lady because when she appears on the page, she's nothing impressive. And yet God takes a humble heart and does something that we will literally be talking about forever. So what is he saying not just to women, she's saying to all of us, if you will maintain humility, God can do some incredible stuff through you. You can maintain humility. I'm going to tell you a secret about me that nobody knows except maybe my wife and a few others. You ready to hear this secret? I tend to be a little contrary. I look at things, and my first reaction is to say, is that really true? So the other day, I was driving by, and there was this new church planner or something, and they had signs that they were showing to traffic. And uh, one of the signs they were holding up said, you are amazing. And I looked at that and thought, I am not. See, that's how contrary I can be. 
I'm not, because I am not amazing. I am sinful. I'm amazed at how selfish I can be. I'm amazed at how frail I can be. I'm amazed at sometimes how little faith I have. Believe me, this is not false modesty. I'm not amazing. But I serve an amazing God. God is going to take this very unamazing man and do something people will be talking about forever. I think I'm going to get to help some people make it to heaven that wouldn't have made it otherwise. That's amazing. But it's not going to happen because I'm amazing. It's going to happen because I serve an amazing God who uses very unamazing people. I want to tell you a secret. You're not amazing. Oh, you're not amazing. You're sinful. At times you're weak. At times you're very selfish. At times you're very flawed. Got to get an amen. Sometimes you're impatient. Sometimes you're grouchy. <laughs> Linda's having revival down here. Sometimes your faith doesn't even amount to a mustard seed. And this is the amazing thing. God is going to take someone as unamazing as you and do some stuff that people will be literally talking about forever. People will be standing around in heaven saying, see that guy? See that girl? They told me about Jesus. They had a lot of problems and kinks and quirks and all that. Stuff, but they showed me who Jesus is. And that's what Mary is saying. I'm not amazing, but man, I serve an amazing God. I serve an amazing Jesus. What an incredible, credible witness. You don't have to be amazing for God to do some amazing things through you. Amen? And that's the first lesson from the ladies, is that in your unimpressive life, God is going to do some things that will literally last forever. As eternal ages roll by, the work and the outcome of your life is going to still be going on. Wow, that is amazing. But someone as unamazing as you. <laughs> I wouldn't make it as an inspirational speaker, would I? You know. The second lesson from the lady is that there's power in Jesus' touch. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. I want to say something that is going to make you very uncomfortable. Are you ready? I'll read it literally. And a woman was there who had been menstruating for 12 years. 12 years. And all the ladies said, Oh, my God. You can't get this if I don't talk blunt with you. If you read your Old Testament, when this was happening, a lady was considered ceremonially unclean for seven days and could not go to the temple, to the house of God, for seven days. In fact, if you read Leviticus very closely, if you touched a woman at this time, you too were ceremonial unclean, and you couldn't go to the temple. And so you find this person, a woman of the Old Testament, that when she was at this point in the month, she was basically banished from the community. You could not go near her if you touched something she touched. You were ceremonially unclean. You were incapable then of going into the house of God and worshiping the Most High God because there was something in your body that was bleeding. Now read it this way. And the woman was there who was subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she... She was bankrupt. Yet instead of getting better, it just got worse. 
When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched. Oh, you can't do that. It's against the law. You touch somebody, they become unclean. She came up behind him. She should have been banished, unfit to touch anybody. But Jesus, she touched his cloak. Oh my goodness, she's in rebellion. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Here's the thing that's so amazing about this to me. Jesus is attacking the oppression of women. Admit it. A few minutes ago, when I used the word menstruating, you all got uncomfortable, didn't you? We have three admitted, the rest of you are liars. You got uncomfortable, didn't you? In fact, right up until church time, I was arguing myself whether to use that word or not. I thought I'd ask my wife, but I knew what the answer would be. What is more feminine and female than this subject? And it made us all uncomfortable. And yet Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us about it. Something's going on here. Jesus, through the Gospels, is dealing with an issue here. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around to the, in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples said, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around, seeing who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear. You may have never understood why. She did what was illegal. She was ceremonial unclean with this issue of blood. You're not supposed to touch anybody, and no one's supposed to touch anything that you have touched. And she did. She was trembling with fear and told him the whole truth. Now she's expecting to get in big trouble because now he can't even go to the temple. But he said to her, and you can't get this because you're not a Jew, but man, if you were Jewish, this would blow your mind. So pretend you're Jew for a moment. Daughter, daughter, what does daddy say? Baby girl, baby girl, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering go in peace and be free from your suffering what does she tell us she tells us that a hopeless situation is not hopeless when Jesus is near again I know this is a little bit awkward but imagine you're moving along in your monthly cycle. It starts, and 12 years later, it hasn't ended. She was without hope. She had been banished, labeled as unclean, and rejected by the community for 12 stinking years. And then Jesus came by. And something in her said, no doctor has been able to help me, but if I could just get through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment, this is going to stop, and I'm going to become a normal woman again. Amen? What is the lesson? I don't know if, you're, if, if you've been there or if you are there right now, but sometimes 
you have a problem that has lasted so long and is so unsolvable that you lose hope that it will ever be solved. And I always imagine when you see there's a crowd, the Bible says she pushed through the crowd. A lot of times there's a lot of people between you and Jesus. Amen? There's a lot of people in the way. If you could just get them out of the way, you could get to him and touch him, but there's a lot of people there, and you've got to press through them in order to just tap the hem of his garment. So she's teaching us that there's no hopeless situations. Not when Jesus is around. Amen? The terrible thing is that Hopeless situations. I don't, I'm not sure that I'll walk out on this limb, but I'll walk out there and see if you can saw it off. Hopeless situations tend to become faithless situations. For when you're without hope, you're without faith. And you go, oh, there's just no way. This, but for some reason, somehow, when she came into the presence of Jesus, she decided this hopeless situation that's been hanging on to me for 12 years, all of a sudden, is solvable. It might happen now. In fact, not only it might happen, it will happen if I can just touch Jesus. This woman with the issue of blood is saying to us now, Whatever your problem is, whatever your difficulty is, no matter how long you've had it, it is not hopeless if Jesus is around. It's not hopeless if you'll push through the crowd and touch Jesus. Amen? Isn't that a great lesson from this lady? Number three, third lesson from the ladies is if you'll reject offense, rejecting offense prepares us for miracles. We live in a society where everybody's always offended at something. You know, we, we live in a, in a country where we have the idea that everybody's problems will go away if we'll just quit offending each other, you know. If we'll just quit saying unkind things to each other. But I'm not sure that's true. The Bible says there was a Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, she's not a Jew. She's a Canaanite. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. My priority is this. I go and I convert some of the Jews, the Jews from the church, and then the church goes to the Gentiles. That's the way I'm going to do it. So this Canaanite woman, you're out of order. It's not time for me to go to the Gentiles yet. I've got to convert some Jews, then we'll convert some Gentiles. He answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Wow, why did he say that? That was very politically incorrect. That's how the Jews felt about the Gentiles. Yes, Lord, she said, but even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Wow. I'm not going to get offended, she says. Then the Lord answered, again, using the new paraphrase version, baby girl, <laughs> woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed from that very moment God always has a master plan his master plan is convert some Jews then convert the Gentiles first priority is to reach the Jews second priority is to reach the world the Canaanite woman needed Jesus to sort of jump ahead and help her even though it really wasn't her turn yet she persisted, and Jesus made a way. The Canaanite woman's lesson is this. If you refuse to be offended, you have access to miracle-working power. If you refuse to be offended, are you offended? Are you disappointed in God? Can I admit to you something? 
No, yes, no, yes, no. Sometimes, let's, let's put this in the best possible light. Sometimes I get confused by God's inaction. I think God could be, should be doing some stuff he's not doing just yet. And he's not really listening to my opinions very well. And I wonder, God, why don't, why don't you step in and do X, Y, Z? And, and then I can get frustrated and disappointed and say, God, please help me understand. Why don't you do this? This really needs to be done. And, and God doesn't do what I tell God he needs to do. You can claim it by faith, confess it by faith, and sometimes God just kind of moves along. And you go, what is going on, God? But if you will refuse to be offended by God's actions or inactions, then we have access to miracle-working power. I want to tell you one of my favorite stories from church history. Some of you have heard it. If you've been in my classes, you've heard me teach. It's, it's a story about a guy named William Seymour. I mean, how many of you know William Seymour? <coughs> Some of you are trying to remember. William Seymour was a black man from Houston, Texas, who are going to the World Series, by the way. Because that little guy, Jose Otuve, you know, he's my favorite baseball player. Five, six, short people can make a difference. And they all said, there was this Methodist pastor named Charles Parman. Not too far from here, he started a Bible st school in Topeka, Kansas. And he, he decided he didn't care for denominationalism, and, and he raised up a student body. They began to pray and study the book of Acts, and things began to happen in, in Topeka that had only happened in the New Testament that they knew of. And so all this was going on. And mean, meanwhile, Charles Parham moves to Houston, Texas, and leaves that to kind of simmer there in Topeka. And, and he's teaching about, wow, Acts is happening again. Acts is happening again. We're seeing the stuff in the book of Acts happening again. And, and there is, he's teaching this in a school down there. And he, he's trying to raise up another school and teach people, hey, the book of Acts is still happening. And, and there was a black man that was working nearby. And he, he walks by and he hears the lesson. And he stops and listens and he hangs around. And, and afterwards, uh, Charles Parham comes out of the classroom, this black man. Remember, it is, it is uh, about 1900 at this time. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long time ago. And, and civil rights is not even on anybody's radar yet. And, and, and this black man, William Seymour, comes up to Charles Parham. You have these personalities down. And he says, uh, hey, Reverend, do you mind if I come and be a part of your class? Because I, I want to hear about this. And Charles Parham, being a man of his generation, said, no, no. Black people don't sit in class with white people. It's a pivotal moment in the history of the church. Because William Seymour can get offended and say, you low down good for nothing, racist. But instead he said, will you leave the door open? Would you leave the window open? I want to sit outside and listen to this new teaching. So he, he sits outside and he takes notes and he's listening. Acts is happening again. And meanwhile, this black preacher gets a call from Los Angeles and there's a ch black church out there that is saying come out here and speak for us he arrives in Los Angeles and uh, he says hey guys Acts is happening again and at that the pastor said uh you're not going to speak here another chance to get offended we don't we don't want that weird stuff going on here so, so uh, William Seymour goes a few blocks away on Azusa Street. There's a little mission building, and he starts holding prayer meetings on Azusa Street. And revival breaks out. And they had church literally night and day for years. Every Pentecostal or full gospel 
church or fellowship in the world today traces its roots back to that prayer meeting where William Seymour said, I refuse to get offended. God's got too much for me, for me to be offended. Wherever you go, whoever you are, people will be biased against you. Some, it's worse than others. I concede that. But I have a theory. Some of you ladies are dismissed simply because you're females. They, they won't listen to your knowledge simply because you're a girl. You can't be offended by that. Go on and show them what God can do through a girl. Amen? I believe... Here's my second theory. <laughs> Let's hear it. That when people hear a southern accent, they immediately conclude that you're ignorant. People are biased when they hear my Arkansas draw. And they think, you can't. I loved it so much, and to God be the glory. When I went to Bible college, and I came in with terrible grammar and a very thick accent, and people would dismiss me, and then I got to setting the curve on the test, and I'd say, hey, y'all didn't do as well as I did. <laughs> it was great vindication in that. Some people will dismiss you because you don't look right. I'm about to start a political action group for chubby people. People look down on us. They think we're out of control. They don't realize we just have a metabolism problem that loves cookies. Inside, there's a thin person screaming to get out. I can usually just shut him up with a Twinkie, though. Refuse to be offended. Refuse to be offended. If you'll refuse to be offended, believe me, the enemy is going to make sure that there's people in your lives, coming and going in your lives, that are going to give you reasons to be offended. And some of us carry offense around like it's a badge of honor. I would have done something great, but then somebody did said, that, said this and did this. And, did, and so we forfeit the good things that God was going to do through our life. We would have understood had William Seymour said, those bigoted white people would not let me go to Bible college, and who knows what God might have done. Instead, he said, I'm not letting that stop me. God has a call on my life, and that life is bigger than their racism. Amen? God is bigger than their sexism. God is bigger than whatever ism they might have to have. Just don't let offense stop you. Let's do one more real quickly. Do not slumber until you're prepared. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. Jesus could have come up with any symbol because this is a parable. But he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten young ladies who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they became, all became drowsy and fell asleep. At the midnight cry, the darkest hour of the night, the cry went out, Here's the bridegroom, go out to meet him. All the virgins, all the young ladies woke up and trimmed their light, lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some oil. Some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. This oil is non-transferable. Instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. But while they were on the way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came, saying, Sir, sir, 
or Lord, Lord, open the door. He replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, Jesus is saying, now, because of us, I said this, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Um, I'm not going to preach that, you know, we could preach a full sermon on this. I'm just going to cut to the chase. This is one of the most famous illustrations in all the Bible about the end of the age, the parable of the ten virgins. It is not a parable of the rapture. I grew up hearing that. Be ready because the rapture could happen at midnight. That's not the point of this parable. Please hear me. The point of this parable is that we will be called to walk out through a season of darkness that will be so dark that we will have to have extra light to get through that darkness. In the rapture, I'm going to be gone like that. I won't need any oil. I'm just going to be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says we'll all be changed. That's, that's, that's not this. The Bible says this is the time when the call will go out. It's time to move forward. And the darkness will be so dark that if you don't have extra oil, you will not be able to navigate that darkness. Are you listening? Are you? Because I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to tell you something real, real important. The lesson from the parable of the virgins. There will be a season of great spiritual darkness. And you and I have to make sure we have enough oil to get through it if we're going to be ready for Jesus when he comes. Now I'll just talk to you for a moment. Um, in my opinion, do you guys know I had a birthday last week? <laughs> Yeah, all right. Took a group of men to, to uh, Nicaragua a few years ago and Ecuador also at another time. And one of the phrases I learned and to tell the guys, respect to altus mayores, which basically means respect your elders. Every once in a while the guys would be cutting up and I would give them the Spanish word. Respect your elders. So, since I had a birthday, respect your elders. In all the decades of my life and in all the decades of my ministry, I'm telling you, I have never seen spiritual darkness the way it is descending on us now. It's not some tangible something. It is spiritual. People are doing things under the influence of this darkness and they don't even know why. You ever had... I remember one time I, I walked outside and there was these two boys that jumped off their bicycles and had taken their shoes off and we had these little solar lights on the sidewalk and they were beating those lights, breaking them. You know, just, just, and I, I ran up. They didn't know I was there. I ran up and I grabbed both of them. Well, they thought Jesus had come back all of a sudden. And I took them in my office and I sat them down and I called their parents. And, and uh, I, I said, why were you doing that? You know what they said? I don't know. Why are you tearing up church property? I don't know. You know what lately I hear a lot to Christians? I say, why did you do that? I don't know. Why, why did you say that? I don't know. Why did you act like that? I don't know. Why in the world would you do that? I don't know. There's a spiritual darkness 
that is descending upon the earth. And if we are not prayed up, if we don't have extra oil in our lamps, we'll be sitting around surrounded by our own sin and our own devastating decisions. And someone will say, why did you do that? And we're honestly going to say, I don't know. I don't know. I know. I know why we did it. It's midnight. Spiritually, it's midnight. The forces of darkness are thicker than I've ever seen them in my life. The power of the enemy is more embraced by this world than it has ever been. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Have you, have you watched the political debates, the war on biblical Christianity? You know, just the other day in Europe, uh, I believe it was England, declared that the Bible is incompatible with civil society. We are moving toward a time. And the liberalism there is being transported over here. We're, we're moving into a time when the darkness is gaining control. We can now rip a child from his mother's womb, throw him or her in a trash can, and call it righteousness. They're even calling it the work of God. I heard it. We are in an era where darkness is darker than it's ever been. The parable of the virgins has never been more relevant. I'll say this, and, and I, I got to shut up because you're overloaded. Um, you may have been able to dance around the fringes in the past. You can't anymore. You can't serve God in this dark environment if you're not the real deal. You're going to be doing things that you would have never done and you're going to be going, I don't know why I did that. There's a darkness that is coming against us. And the only antidote for darkness is the oil of the Holy Spirit. The only antidote is the oil of the Holy Spirit. Why did Jesus say the kingdom will be like ten young ladies? Five of them were heroic. Five of them not so much. What he's doing, he's elevating women. He's elevating them. And he's saying, he's, he's nailing at the heart of Oppression, a lack of appreciation, lack of protection. And he's saying to his church, if there is any place where women should be valued, it's in the body of Jesus Christ. Amen? If there's any place where they are appreciated and nurtured and protected. It should be in the body of Jesus Christ. Guys, we should be the shiny examples to a lost world that doesn't know how to treat women that we show this is how real men treat women. This is how saints act. This is how the redeemed act. The darkness is dark but you have access to oil. But bull, believe me, if you're sleeping without an extra supply of it, 
you're not going to make it till dawn. In the midnight hour, there's going to be oppression come against you. There's going to be a darkness come against you. There are going to be thoughts and feelings come against you. There's going to be temptation that's going to come against you. And if you don't have the oil to light up that lamp and drive away that darkness, you will be succumbed to it. That's the message of the ten virgins. At least it's the message of five of the ten virgins. Will you stand with me, please? How about this? If the lady of your life, your wife, girlfriend, significant other, is with you today, we, guys, I'm talking to you, you'll just reach over and put your hand on her shoulder or her back or take her by the hand if you want. I want you to see if you can follow me in prayer. You don't have to out loud. Maybe whisper along behind me. Jesus, help me be the man she needs. Always remind me, Lord, that when I deal with her, I deal with your daughter, your baby girl. Help me to appreciate her, to love her, to value her, and protect her. Not just physically. Help me protect her heart. Help me protect her emotions. Help me protect her mind. Lord, you love her with such an all-consuming love. Please make me a vessel through which that love is channeled. Make me a vessel that she feels that love. Help me as a man of God treat her as a woman of God. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Savior, I'm asking you, sir, please give them the faith right now to know that you died on a cross for their sins. And give them the faith to believe in their heart and confess with their mouth. Jesus is Lord. And in so doing, to know that their name is being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name.